tell you, shalom, 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 everybody. Welcome back to reading with Shalom, man. Shalom, shalom. everybody. Shalom. Hmm. I am my camera, boy. Anyway, we about to get back into the next session, the next two chapters of two the, chapters. the Art of Conversation. Conversation. The Art of Conversation by Stephen Hawks. Stephen Hawks. Hey. We're going to read chapter five and six today. Chapter five and six today. Starting a conversation is chapter five. Chapter five. And chapter six is the context of a conversation. The context of a conversation. The context. The context. Oh, conversation. Ah, conversation. Conversation. Chapter five. Chapter five. Starting a conversation. Conversation. conversation is an art form, an and with form. and without the correct set of paints, someone's masterpiece can quickly become a disaster. disaster. The first brush stroke in painting a conversation is finding a way to introduce yourself to a group or other individual. An individual. 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 Knowing how and when to insert an opinion into a conversation can be the determining factor in whether it is accepted. Easy, easy conversation starters and comments can be a simple starting point for people looking to join an interaction. Focusing on other people helps them open up and feel more comfortable with sharing information. And sharing information. 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 A person can do this by asking about their hobbies or interests. Interest. In addition to knowing how to start a conversation, a, start a, a person should know how to end one. End one. Rather, or rather, or rather, or rather, how not to end one. Or not to end one. How not to end one. Overusing compliments is a way to make people wary of interacting with someone because they may be seen as untrustworthy or inauthentic. 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 There is a limit on how many compliments you can give before you are seen as sucking up to someone, which is never a good look. This chapter discusses various ways a person can do can introduce themselves when joining a group conversation in easy statements that can get a conversation moving. This chapter looks at different ways to start and sustain small talk with others in a variety of situations. Finally, it will discuss the ways a person may unintentionally end a conversation and how to avoid compliments being misinterpreted as having an uh, ulterior motive. Keys to conversation. Becoming part of an established conversation is one of the more difficult, but not impossible, task when attempting to expand your social skills. The key is to interject something meaningful and then take a step back and allow the group to receive it. This shows that a person has something to add to the conversation, but does not want to dominate the group. It allows the other people in the group to elevate or evaluate what a person can contribute and make the decision to open the conversation to them. So the interrogation of the interrogation is as seamless as possible, with which reduces awkwardness. One way for a person to use this tactic is to be assertive with their contribution. They can directly introduce themselves to the group and invite the speaker to continue with their thoughts. This demonstrates to the group that a person has no intention on coming of coming in and commanding the conversation. It shows a willingness to be a listener as well as a speaker. 
which is more likely to gain approval from others who may see the new person as a threat to the conversational flow. The direct approach can signal confidence, which may encourage others to pursue one-on-one -on -one conversation with the person. Another, less assertive way to join a conversation is to wait patiently next to the group until the members invite you. Waiting patiently establishes your presence, and being near the group shows you how interested in what they are discussing. In some circles, waiting to be invited into the conversation may be seen as the more polite approach. Some people do not like others interrupting the conversation, but when an established group member brings in a new person, there is a dynamic of acceptance. If the group is only loosely formed, then small talk with members can be a good way to ease yourself into the discussion. Small talk can serve as a stepping stone to feeling comfortable in large group situations. It gives a person an experience of starting simple conversations with people and building an impromptu topic on building on impromptu topics. Small talk can sometimes seem more difficult because it is one on one, but there is more room for improvement in, in the early stages of conversation because a person is only dealing with one other person's feedback. It gives a person more opportunity to ask questions and learn about the best ways to phrase questions and what may be a difficult question for someone to answer. Another benefit of small talk is that it can happen with anyone. So a person can gain valuable experience interacting with strangers. It can happen at water coolers and line at the grocery store or coffee shops or even on the bus during someone's daily commute. Simply having the confidence to approach others can be the difference between the great talk on the way to work and a silent bus ride. Man, man. Excuse me. I'll leave this. Give me a second. I'm going to check on my boys right quick. Leave it, man. My apologies. My apologies. I'll make sure I check on my boy, man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. 
There are opportunities to interact with people everywhere. Then small talk is a great way to take advantage of them. Keeping it simple is often preferable to launching into deep conversations, especially with someone you don't know very well. Starting a conversation with personal information or a conversational or controversial topic can make the other person feel awkward or uncomfortable. Small talk is valuable for measuring where someone's conversational boundaries are and thus not overstepping them. This method of easing into conversation helps build trust and connection between the conversational partners, between the conversational partners. It allows both parties to decide when they feel comfortable sharing more personal information and creates organic opportunities to do so. Sometimes easing in takes place over multiple conversations and not all at once, but it still accomplishes the same goals. If a person is struggling to find a topic to use in beginning, in beginning small talk, they should think of something unique and casual to ask the other person to get the ball rolling. After introducing yourself and disposing the, ple the pleasantries, a person can ask about where a person grew up or what plans they they're excited about that week. These questions, these questions not only make someone more memorable, but also move the speaker into an open position in which they can share more about themselves. If someone is looking for more than just small talk, then inquiring about a person's interests or hobbies can be a great go-to in starting a conversation. Most people enjoy talking about themselves and the things that interest them. So it is a safe bet that these questions will start a robust conversation. Although it may seem like an ob obvious tactic, people will usually take any opportunity to discuss their interests with others. It can be especially lucky if someone interests if someone's interests align with the in, with the inquirers, because then they are able to contribute to the conversation and offer their own opinions. With luck, with luck, the two may form a friendship through the shared interests. Some people don't give off signals that they want to be spoken to but they may not realize they are shooting away potential conversational partners. For example, if someone is reading a book, a person, should, should, a person could sit down next to them and ask what the book is about. If the reader responds positively, the person could then ask them to describe the plot. If there is no obvious introduction to the conversation, the person could start by sharing information about themselves. Not all people are immediately receptive to small talk, and a person may need to employ some icebreakers to lighten the mood and make the other person feel more comfortable sharing information about themselves. Everyone has experienced the corny icebreaker games teachers make them play in high school to learn about the class. These games are not always a good fit for adult situations. However, the other types of icebreakers may need to be used. These can be comments, observations, or questions, but they are generally easy to answer and encourage the person to look up at the speaker and acknowledge their comments. Examples of icebreakers are sharing fun facts about yourself. If there are any of you, if, or if there are any you find particularly interesting or pointing out something out of the ordinary happening in the immediate area, the latter especially encourages the person to look up from whatever they are doing and acknowledge the comment, which can easily lead to a conversation. Dad jokes or corny puns are another way to strike up a conversation when the other person approaches first. If the person says, oh, your shoe is untied, then someone could respond, no, I'm Bill. Make a joke out of, out of a passing comment is the way is a way to relax the other person and show them you are not intimidated or rude. Oh, your shoe's untied. Then someone could respond, no, I'm Bill.
making a joke out of a passing comment is a way to relax the other person and show them you are not intimidating or rude. This joke is a clean transition into introductions, and that is a natural start to any conversation. There are many tactics someone can use to start a conversation, but it is typically a good idea to keep it light and funny if possible. Putting people at ease before an interaction is an art form, but with practice, most people can achieve it. It's all about reading the visual cues. What waiting for the right time and choosing an easy topic to discuss with anyone. These skills are the building blocks of successful small talk. How to kill a conversation. I think I've killed plenty of them. The contrary art of starting conversations is abruptly ending them. Even the most organic conversations are subject to certain comments or subjects that sour people's moods and in the, in the exchange. These comments are not always intentional. So it is helpful to be aware of what they are so that a person does not accidentally kill a good conversation. One sure way to kill a conversation is to add negative feedback. Part of interacting with others is providing feedback to help solve a problem or contribute to a difficult situation. This positive exchange of ideas is what draws people to conversations and social interactions. It is what promotes the positive psychological effects and social fulfillment people derive from conversation. Adding negative feedback in a positive environment can turn everyone's mood quickly and make them not want to discuss the topic further. It is an easy way for someone to show others they are not interested in solving problems or collaborating in a group. A second way to unintentionally end a conversation is to constantly point out faux pas and make or mistakes the other pre, the other people make. <laughs> if someone miss misspeaks and it does not change their message, it does no good to point out their mistakes in front of others. This is a type of negative feedback. It makes people think too much about what they will say and if it is correct instead of focusing on what they are trying to say. Forcing people to edit themselves when they speak does not promote an open and friendly environment. Often, if someone constantly points out others' mistakes, then people will stop speaking with them to avoid the negative feedback. Most people don't want to contribute negatively to conversation, to a conversation, so they might turn to compliments as a way to positively, positively reinforce their place in, an, in a group or invite it into the conversation. It is well known that people enjoy hearing compliments. It can boost self-esteem and confidence and make someone feel appreciated and liked. These results are the reason some people choose to use compliments as a way into groups. This tactic, however, can turn bad quickly if someone does not know how to walk the line between complimenting someone and sucking up to them with too much flattery, which can make people feel awkward, especially if, the over, if this overuse of flattery is directed towards the opposite sex. Compliments show someone has an interest in a topic or person and demonstrates that they would like to be included in a discussion either currently or in the future. An effective compliment makes other people want to include someone into their, in, in their interactions. It sticks with people, so they always remember that the person is inter interested in a particular topic. Effective compliments match positive feelings with a certain person, which makes it more likely people will include them in the future. As previously mentioned though, Compliments should not be doled out uncontrollably. There's a fine line in terms of when compliments become suspicious, and people may think the speaker is only out to gain something. People who overtly flatter others are generally not trusted and can have more difficulty joining groups. Therefore, knowing how many compliments are enough is imperative. It may be difficult to determine whether frequent compliments are leading into awkward territory. 
In these situations, a person can examine the type of and frequency of compliments to sh be sure their words are not mistakenly mistaken for overflattery. Since knowing when to stop can be the difference between acceptance and the cold shoulder, it is important to remember that there are very few ways to there are a few ways to keep compliments in check. One way concerns itself more with complimenting people, and the other is focused on complimenting in general. When complimenting complimenting people, too frequent praise can be inter interpreted as trying to gain favor, especially if the person being complimented is a boss or superior. Keeping compliments to a minimum when it comes to superficial observations, such as someone's appearance, is typically the best practice. You should never find yourself searching for something to compliment. Good qualities speak for themselves and do not need to be sought out to praise. Compliment complimenting someone every day can grow tedious, for both parties and is often eventually perceived as needless flattery. If a person simply saves compliments for genuine moments, then they can usually stay in the same zone. That's chapter five. Starting a conversation. Let's get to chapter six, the context of a conversation. Context of a conversation. Interacting with others can stir up a lot of feelings in a person, good and bad. These feelings can be dictated by what is said, who the speaker is, who the speaker is speaking with, or even the environment they're in. Conversational environments can include both physical space and emotional setting and have a considerable impact on the success of the interaction. Along with the environment, the overall context of the conversation is also important. Context can mean the difference between talking about running home from work or running home from third base on the baseball field. Depending on when someone comes into the conversation, they might not have enough information to understand that the group is having, they might not have enough information to understand that the group is discussing a baseball game and not a marathon run. Context can come from visual clues or emotional signals. Showing how a person might react to a particular subject. When people do not have the correct context, they may jump to conclusions about the information someone is providing. Even with the proper context, sometimes people spend more energy attempting to piece information together than attempting to retain it all. This can lead to people missing, missing opportunity, missing important information, and not paying adequate attention to a speaker. When conclusions are drawn, assumptions are often made as well. Assumptions take conclusions one step further because when people assume, they decide their conclusions are true and act on them as facts. Making assumptions can be harmful to relationships and should never be done without first seriously considering whether the information one has is true. This chapter will discuss various types of conversational environments and how a person can identify them. It will talk about how to act in various environments to maintain the status quo and not create an awkward situation. Then you will, we will move to how context contributes to conversations and how to notice context before starting a conversation. Finally, we will examine how drawing conclusions and making assumptions can be harmful to interactions and relationships. Yes, sir. How y'all doing? Come on. Oh, okay. I'm glad y'all came and check on me. I was wondering what y'all was up to. Oh, okay. Did you wipe your butt good? Say it again. You think so? <laughs> 
<laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> That's one I found outside. We're going to check it out in a little bit, all right? <laughs> DJ. Yes, sir. No, yeah, I'm a, I'm a hammer. I'm a hammer. Hammer it correctly. Yes, sir. I'm gonna use the hammer and hammer it out so I can use it. Yes, sir. Well, let me get back to reading, okay? Understand the situation and reading the room. People react and adapt to their environments in many ways, including how to communicate. To have a successful interaction with someone, it is important to take the social environment into account before deciding on how to approach the conversation. The environment of a conversation can be determined by considering a few factors. The location, for example, can determine the volume of intim and intimacy of the conversation. How many people are included in the conversation cre can create uh, an environment for certain kinds of discussion that everyone can participate in. Being aware of the environment, the environment helps a person avoid making mistakes or social profiles. One example of a delicate conversational environment would be if someone joined a support group for for people with social anxiety. Calm down, sir. For example, one example of a delicate conversational environment would be if someone joined a support group for people with social anxiety. Because the group exists to encourage the members to overcome fears, this would be an inappropriate place for, ne for negative feedback or interrupting others. Another consideration when determining the environment is the, the volume of the conversation. As mentioned, some group conversations can get rowdy and people may start yelling just to be heard over others. If someone is in a quiet place though, such as a library or office, speaking too loudly may be inappropriate for that setting. Conversations alone can even create an environment with the words people choose and tone, the tone of the speakers. This is a type of emotional environment that people should be aware of when deciding how to respond to people. If people are discussing their feelings or vulnerabilities, they most likely think they are in a safe, relaxed environment, free of judgment. A person walking into that situation should notice the delicacy of the emotional environment and respect the person speaking because by actively listening and offering caring feedback. Not all emotional environments are positive, though. Sometimes a person may find themselves in an angry or judgmental environment. For example, if someone is sitting in the meeting at work and the boss begins to reprimand a coworker in front of everyone, this can create a negative emotional environment. Don't put that in your mouth. Why do why why shouldn't you put that in your mouth? Why shouldn't you? Tell me why you shouldn't put that in your mouth. Hmm? Do you know why you shouldn't put that in your mouth? You should not put that in your mouth because that is dirty. Do you know where I found that? Outside. Yes, sir. Where outside? In the grass. That's correct. In the dirt, to be exact. In the yes, sir. So I have not washed that yet because it has to be hammered out. I need to fix it first. So where does it not belong? Where does it not belong? Nowhere. No, it does not belong in your what? It does not belong in your what? In your mouth. Yes, sir. 
It does not belong where? Where? That is correct, son. It does not belong in your mouth. Now, you can play with it. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But do not put it where? That's correct. I don't want the germs or whatever is on that to be in your mouth. Do you understand? Okay. Deep breaths. Relax. Calm yourself. Just don't put it in your mouth. Okay? That's you all. Dry it up. You're all right. It's okay. Just don't put it in your mouth, all right? All right, we good. You all right, DJ? You all right? Oh. There we go. People may be reluctant to speak up because I'll start off from the paragraph. Not all emotional environments are positive, though. Sometimes a person may find themselves in an angry or judgmental environment. For example, if someone is sitting in a, in a, in a meeting at work. And the bit and the boss begins to reprimand the coworker in front of everyone. This can create a negative emotional environment. People may be reluctant to speak up because they see the boss is angry and do not want to be included in the negative back and forth. These situations are not always so straightforward. So looking for signs of stress, such as clenched fists or grit, gritted teeth, can give a clue that you are walking into a negative emotional environment. There are some key things a person can do to ensure they are promoting a healthy, happy, conversational environment. The first is to establish the, the emotional environment as a safe place. <laughs> by encouraging trust and honesty, by using open body language and eye contact, which can demonstrate to others that a person is willing to interact in a positive environment. This can make people feel more comfortable sharing their feelings because they do not have the, the, to fear judgment or negative critiques. Another way to promote a positive environment is by accepting the people's ideas and willing to discuss them with the open mind. When others know they will not have to walk on eggshells in a conversation. It can encourage them to elaborate on ideas and continue the conversation. A person can build on this by showing appreciation for the other person opening up and offering helpful feedback. To show appreciation, someone can recognize when the speaker makes valid points or use, act, or use active listening techniques, such as nodding or verbally agreeing with what is being said. People who feel appreciated in the conversation are often inclined to speak with their conversational partner again in the future. Just as social interactions are dictated by the environment, they can be dictated by the context surrounding them. Context is similar to environment because it can be both physical and emotional, but context goes a little deeper than just what is going on in the conversation. Context employs the meaning of the, in, the, meaning of the environment and the social cues. A person can find context as in facial cues, body language, or asking someone about an observed difference. Knowing the context in the, in the conversation can ensure someone knows how to proceed without offending their partner or being perceived as rude. Sometimes there are multiple layers of context, but a person can typically rely on what they can pick up on their own to get started in the conversation. 
Facial expressions are, are an easy way to gain context regarding how someone feels about the topic being discussed. If their face is relaxed and they are making eye can contact with the speaker, they are probably, probably interested in the topic. If their face is in a grimace or a frown or they refuse to look at the speaker, however, they're probably disapprove of with either the topic or the speaker's opinion on it. Some facial cues are even more subtle, such as a furrowed brow, someone touching their face or eyes darting around the room. A furrowed brow usually shows frustration or confusion and often means a person, a person is working through a problem on their own. Keeping an eye and body language, which often goes together with facial expressions, is another way to track conversational context. Open postures such as leaving arms open and leaving one, one's arms at one side is sitting or sitting facing the crowd shows someone, how can I help you? If you want to go, you can go. Yeah, you ain't got to stay here. Let me see this phone. Can you hand me that phone, please, sir? Bring me that phone. Right there. Just bring it to me. Thank you. Open postures, such as leaving one's arms at one side or sitting facing the crowd, show someone is willing to engage in a conversation. Closed postures, such as crossed arms or sitting facing the wall, are typically signs of someone is not interested in speaking with others. Context can be social or cultural, different, cultural differences within a group which may change the way the group members perceive or understand the information. For example, if an American gave a thumbs up to someone from the Middle East and the, that person got upset, the American might be confused. Say it again, sir. All right, I'm not tripping. I'm not worried about it either. Without the context, of uh, that the thumbs up is a rude gesture in some Middle Eastern cultures, an American might offend the other person. Communication disorders, such as hearing loss, can be a barrier, barrier to interactions without context. If someone is aware that they are speaking to someone with profound hearing loss, they can compensate by using hand gestures or sign language to properly convey their message. Take your time. When interacting with others, it is basic human nature to make infer inferences from the information we receive, but these inferences may not always be based on fact. People tend to jump to conclusions when they receive information, and this can sometimes even keep them from hearing all of the information. Conclusions drawn from speculation are seldom accurate and can even damage uh, relationships when the person becomes uh, upset about the con about a conversation they made they've made this is why it's important to always consider information rationally and logically before forming a conclusion or opinion about someone or something if a person is in a conversation and they are not sure of something or notice themselves starting to draw conclusions based on incomplete information, a simple fix is to ask the other person to clarify their meaning. This gives the speaker an opportunity to give needed background or additional information that can provide more context for the situation. Conclusions are often drawn when a person does not have the proper context. So remembering tricks with which to gain context can help the help with gathering information. When someone is presenting copious amounts of information at once, a person should remember to be patient and wait until the speaker is finished to draw conclusions. Making assumptions halfway through someone giving information is a sure way to get wrong to get the wrong idea. A good trick to avoid falling into this trap is to actively listen to people. 
when a person employs the skill used in, in, in active listening, they are more, more focused on the words and the meanings being behind, focused on the words and the meanings behind them than their own thoughts. This means they do not have time to come up with conclusions while the speaker is talking because they are busy talking, taking in information. After letting the other person finish, you can then take time to put the pieces together and draw an informed conclusion. Part of drawing an accurate conclusion means breaking down the parts of a person's spoken information into manageable chunks. It can be tempting to glaze over parts of the conversation that were difficult to understand, but this can mean missing key, missing key pieces of information. If a person can be patient with the way they process information, they will typically be less likely to draw inaccurate conclusions. Jumping to conclusions is especially easy for people with social anxiety because their discomfort during conversations can cause their mind to race and make it difficult to focus on the speaker for the entire duration of a conversation. As discussed in chapter two, people with social anxiety can have trouble regulating self-criticism. This sometimes leads to them bracing themselves in conversation for a blow they're sure is coming. For example, Someone with social anxiety may interrupt someone with a direct conversation skill as being forceful and conclude that this person does not like them. They may draw the conclusion that the person is rude and thinks they are stupid, but this is not based on rational information. For people who find themselves in this situation, it can be helpful to take a moment and mentally step back from the situation and assess it without their emotions getting in the way. If a person can look at the entire picture, not just their own interpretation of the situation, they are more likely to draw a rational conclusion as compared to an emotional one. Part of learning from this process is acknowledging how the initial conclusion was incorrect and how to adjust one's thought process in the future. In line with not rushing to conclusions, people should avoid making assumptions based on their inferences. An assumption is when someone draws a conclusion from the information they have and decide it is in effect, even though they may not have all the information. This goes one step further than the, con than the conclusion by treating someone that has not been confirmed as, by treating something that has not been confirmed as true as if it is an undeniable fact. Assumptions can be determinate de detrimental. Assumptions can be detrimental. Did you know that? Assumptions can be detrimental relation to relationships, both intimate and friendly. Assumptions can lead to accusations, which can shatter the trust two people have between one another. To ensure that they are not making assumptions, a person should, should follow a similar pro procedure as an attempting to draw conclusions, as attempting not to draw conclusions. Excuse me. Take a step back from the situation and ask what evidence there is. Uh, then a uh, given a... I'm reading terrible today, DGZ. Oh, I am. I need to take my time and slow it down. Yes, sir. All right. All right. Whew. Take a step back from the situation and ask what evidence there is that a given idea is a fact. If a person cannot trace the information back to the speaker or another undeniable source, then it is most likely an assumption. People need to try to notice the difference between facts and assumptions and therefore keep open lines of communication. If a person refrains from assuming and instead asks for clarity, they are more likely to obtain accurate information. This encourages further conversations and interaction with others and shows that a person is a trustworthy friend. Refraining from making assumptions allows people to stay away from unwanted conflict 
and unintended in offense. If an assumption is incorrect and someone tells it to others, then they can potentially be harming other person's reputation, another person's reputation. Hey, go see what go see what man man talk about, please, DJ. Thank you, sir. They could potentially be harming another person's reputation. If they accuse someone of something they don't, they didn't do based on an assumption, it can lead to losing that person in their in their life over something silly. Simply asking questions to clarify confusing information or situations can keep a person away from assuming and potentially harming others. All right, tell them I'll be there in just a second. I'm almost done reading. I got one paragraph left. It can be difficult to retain our brains to stop making assumptions. So being aware of the process and making efforts to change it are key to stopping this practice. When a person notices themselves making an assumption, they should remember to shift from their from their pers perspective to their to that of the speaker. Sometimes thinking about a situation from someone else's point of view can provide some clarity. It can help a person consider the meaning of a speaker's words and how they feel about the information. They should remember to think through the information and process it logically, not emotionally, to find the facts within the draw, within and draw a likely conclusion. And that was the end of chapter six. I wanna say is the context of a conversation. Oh man, I don't think I was reading too well today, but we made it through. We pushed through. We'll come back next time with chapter seven, courtesy and respect, and chapter eight, keeping conversation light and the power of laughter. Which seem like short chapters. So we'll come back to them later. So until next time, shalom. Check me out. <laughs> and I hope you all have a wonderful day. And I hope you I hope that you enjoyed the reading. Enjoyed the reading. And that you got something from it. Got something from it. That you can learn and grow from. Learn and grow from. So with that, shalom. Shalom.